Questions, questions orales, l'honorable. The Honorable Member from Miganti Clérable. Promises, promises but never results. That is the Liberal government's trademark, Mr. Speaker. Despite the fact that it knew for months that Passport Canada was going to fly off a cliff, the minister accelerated the process. Now, people are being told to go online in order to pick a number, to go in line in order to get a passport, but people, was waiting, well, people were waiting all night in the rain for a number. But now it's another new strategy. It takes 15 weeks to f train someone new. Another minister says that she hired a lot of people. So who will finally take the responsibility of this monumental liberal fiasco? The Honourable Minister for Families. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I understand the frustration of Canadians uh, with regards to passports. Starting yesterday, we've, we have had a new strategy and people outside of Guy Favreau, for example, have received uh, appointments. 250 people in Laval and Saint Laurent got to talk to an upper manager. They have been able to get an appointment and now triage is happening in 12 hour blocks to make sure that everyone can travel in time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Miganti Clérable. Mr. Speaker, just imagine this government is so disconnected that it cannot even give simple services to Canadians. It's only today that they've started talking to people waiting outside, Mr. Speaker, but don't you worry. The minister says that now there's toilets, which is great for the rest of the summer. We are looking forward to a very long summer. Inflation. All Canadians have been affected by a rapidly rising cost of living, the highest level of inflation in 40 years when there was another Trudeau at the head of the country. All responsible countries are reducing gas taxes. Why is this government not doing, uh, is refusing to do what is essential for people? That the cost of living is an important issue for Canadians. And that is the reason for which we have taken tangible and concrete measures to help the most vulnerable Canadians. We have increased benefits for Canadian workers. So a three-person family will now have $2,400 more in their pockets this year. We've increased old age security for seniors, a $815 increase. The Honourable Member for Miganti Clérable. But no one's listening because no one believes that this will have an immediate effect on people's lives. We have a Minister for now Public Safety who is duping Canadians in order to justify political decisions. We have a former member, a former minister, who intervened in a police investigation on a tragedy in order to use information for political means. Darren Campbell, an officer from the RCMP, said that the commissioner for the RCMP said that she had promised the minister and the PMO that the RCMP was going to publish the information. My question is simple. Does the Prime Minister believe an RCMP officer? RCMP officer Darren Campbell in this case. Mr. Preparedness. Mr. Speaker, I have never and will not criticize a serving member of the RCMP. I was not a party to the discussions that took place between the Commissioner and her subordinates, and we have made no comment on that discussion. But, Mr. Speaker, I will reiterate that there was no interference in this matter, and the Commissioner of the RCMP has confirmed in her statement on Tuesday that there was no interference or pressure brought to bear by this government. The Honourable Member for Cumberland Colchester. Mr. Speaker, there are handwritten notes confirming political interference during the active police investigation in Portapique, Nova Scotia in 2020. These notes are from a well-respected and experienced RCMP officer. Instead of honesty, we hear this minister doubling down on his rhetoric and disrespecting Parliament and Nova Scotia and blaming other people. Given the gravity of the situation, will the minister admit the political interference and stop this shameful performance? The Honourable Minister. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, of course not, because it wouldn't be true. There was no interference in, in this matter. I would also take the opportunity to remind this House that there is currently an independent public inquiry taking place in Nova Scotia, the Mass Casualty Com Com Commission, in which these very matters are being addressed and where witnesses will be called to testify under oath. The, the work of the Mass Casualty Commission is important to the families of the victims of this terrible tragedy and important to the people of Nova Scotia, and we intend to support the Commission in doing its important work. The Honourable Member for and Cumberland, Colchester. Mr. Speaker, the ongoing disinformation spawned by the former Minister of Public Safety is re-victimizing families and all those affected by the events in Portapique. The clear notes provided by Superintendent Campbell implicitly implicate the Minister in peddling political pressure on Commissioner Lucky. Certainly, we all know from the comments of other officers that Superintendent Campbell is an exemplary officer. If there is truly nothing to hide, will this minister submit to an in-depth investigation? Yes or no? Mr. Speaker, I have absolutely no doubt that Superintendent is an exemplary officer, and I don't question his integrity in any way. I would simply remind this House that the fact is that there was no interference in this matter, and the Commissioner of the RCMP herself issued a statement on Tuesday in which she said very clearly that there was no interference and no pressure brought to bear. That's the facts, Mr. Speaker, but I'd also re remind the member opposite that we have initiated an independent public inquiry that is examining these very issues, and that work will be very important to the families of the victims of this tragedy. The Honourable Member for La Prairie, Mr. Speaker, the federal government's incompetence in managing passports is outstanding. The only solution isn't appointment vouchers, as the Minister is proposing. It's not to hold a 50-50 draw. It's not, like, it's not by organising hunger games. It's by opening offices seven days a week. People are in line, and they're there seven days a week. Mr. Speaker, tomorrow is the Fête Nationale. The minister does not have the right to let citizens without an appointment today sleep outside for another four nights until Monday. That is inhumane. When is she finally going to understand that offices must be open seven days a week with extended hours? The Honourable Minister for Families. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The situation in Montreal is truly unacceptable, and that is the reason for which, starting yesterday, we had teams of managers to talk to people in line to make sure that everyone had a conversation with a manager so that they would receive a, an appointment. Service Canada offices will be open until midnight tonight to help people and serve people who have a new strategy that's been implemented, and appointments are being offered on Fridays and Saturdays to people who are lining up today and whose uh, travel isn't imminent. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. The minister will go to the queues in Quebec and ask people if they are satisfied with being told that this is unacceptable, that we must do better, that we are working hard. Mr. Speaker, the offices must be open seven days a week with extended hours so long as there are no more lines. People are waiting day and night in the rain, completely abandoned. Tension is mounting. People are getting angry. People are in tears. They are victims of federal incompetence. So. Is the government finally going to start actually governing, or is it going to have to ask the help from the army? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Service Canada staff are already working 12, 14, 16 hours a day. They are here from dawn. They are serving Canadians. They are there on Saturdays as well in order to process passports and receive applications during the day. They print passports at night. They're working very hard in this very extraordinary situation that we're experiencing in Montreal. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Speaker, the cost of living is hitting Canadians uh, tremendously hard. We've shared stories uh, as New Democrats about the, the Canadians uh, that are suffering right now can't afford the groceries, can't afford gas. On top of that, CMHC has put forward a report that we are 3 million homes short of ensuring that Canadians can find affordable homes. In fact, that people will not be able to find a home they can afford. Given how serious things are, the government is just waiting to see that it'll go away. It's not going to go away on its own. The government must act to help people now. When will they act to support families who are in need of help? Here, here. The Honourable Minister. 
What do I get? Very, very aware of the need to build more housing supply in Canada. That's why we've introduced the Housing Accelerator Fund. Uh, that is why we are investing $4 billion that, in, that will go directly into municipalities so that they can uh, build more housing supply and that they can do it faster. faster. We're the only government in Canadian history that has taken that step to create systemic change to produce more housing supply. In addition to that, we are also investing in more supply through the Rapid Housing Initiative, more investments in co-op housing, and more investments in the, in the co-investment program. Honourable member for Burnaby South. We know that the cost of living is going up and, that, ha and it, that it has struck families hard. It's more and more difficult. It's sometimes impossible to make ends meet. In these difficult times, we've also read a recent report that says that if the government does not act in Canada, people will not be able to find housing. So, taking all of this into account, when will the government finally and rapidly act in order to help families during this crisis? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, we understand that the cost of living is a very important issue and a very difficult issue for many, many families in Canada. And we also understand that housing is one of the most delicate issues, and that is the reason for which our budget targeted this issue in particular. It's a complicated issue, but housing is essential. We will invest. We will build housing units for Canadians and we will give the most vulnerable people 500 extra dollars for housing. For South Shore St. Margaret's. The Nova Scotia inquiry revealed that RCMP Commissioner Lucky chastised lead investigators saying, quote, the commissioner then said that we did not understand that this was tied to the pending gun control legislation. Also quoted in the documents were RCMP communications officer who said, quote, it was all political pressure. That is 100% the minister and the prime minister. Why would the government believe that why won't the government believe that investigating officers are telling the truth? That's right. Will Minister for Emergency Preparedness. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I would remind the member that I've already stated unequivocally that there was no interference in this matter. And I believe that I will refer the member to the Commissioner's statement in which she also stated unequivocally that there was no interference or pressure. But, Mr. Speaker, Canadians, including those who were directly impacted by this terrible tragedy, have expressed concerns about when and how the RCMP shared information with the public. And that is precisely why, Mr. Speaker, the government specified in the order of reference so that the Mass Casualty Commission examined the communications approach taken both during and after this event. The work of the Casualty Commission is important, Mr. Speaker. Member for South Shore St. Margaret's. This minister opposed the creation of the inquiry, and it's shameful how the Liberals are trying to evade accountability for this outrageous political interference. The minister continues to quote a supposedly independent statement from Commissioner Lucky, a statement that was likely cleared by the public minister's safety minister's office before issuing. In essence, he is quoting himself and impugning the integrity of the investigators. So, when did the Prime Minister's office and the Minister of Public Safety's office approve the Commissioner's statement that this Minister is now using himself to defend himself? Great question. Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The member may not be aware that the, police, the, the Commissioner of the RCMP is independent of government and that there cannot be in law any interference with her work. And I would remind the, the member that on Tuesday the Commissioner issued her own statement in which she stated unequivocally that the principal... I'm, I'm going to interrupt the Honourable Minister. I'm, I'm, I'm about 20 feet away from him and I'm having a hard time hearing him. I'm just going to ask him to continue. Maybe not start over, but continue. Unless it continues, then we'll have to start from the top. The Honourable Minister. I was referencing for this House the statement that the Commissioner released on Tuesday, in which she said, I take the principle of police independence extremely seriously, and it has been and will continue to be 
fully respected in all interactions. Mr. Speaker, that's the truth, and there was no interference in this matter, as there has been no interference by this government in any police operation. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, this is revolting. A great superintendent, Darren Campbell, reports that uh, there was political and partisan interference in the tragedy that happened in Nova Scotia. This is absolutely revolting. It's disgusting. Mr. Speaker, many people trust in Darren Campbell. Like us, in the Globe and Mail, former RCMP boss Bob Paulson said, and I quote, Darren is one of the best investigators on the team. He is a highly reliable officer with very strong integrity. Why does the minister simply not believe Mr. Campbell? The Honourable Minister. Well, let me be very clear, Mr. Speaker. I am not in any way questioning the integrity or the honesty of the superintendent. I know, I know former Commissioner Polson very well, and, and, uh, and I take him very much at his word when he, when he commends the officer for his integrity. However, Mr. Speaker, I will just simply remind this House that in this case, there was no interference in, in, in this matter, and secondly, that the Commissioner is, has issued a statement in which he also says that there has no, been no inter, interference in this matter. And so, Mr. Mr. Speaker, those are simply the facts. The Honourable Member, the Honourable the Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Well, here are the facts, if you want to talk facts. The Minister said that there was no interference, but then Mr Campbell says that there was interference. So who is telling the truth? Very serious people are saying that Mr Campbell is right. In the Globe and Mail, Peter Lepine, a former superintendent, said, I've followed Darren since he started. He's an extremely competent police officer and well prepared for major investigations. Mr Speaker, Choosing between the Minister and Mr Campbell, we choose Mr Campbell. Why is the Minister trying to avoid the truth? Sure. Mr. Speaker, and, and, and again, as I understand it, Superintendent Campbell's referred to a conversation of which we were not party that he had with his commissioner. And, and, and I'm not in any way questioning the man's integrity. My understanding is he is an exemplary police officer. But, Mr. Speaker, let me be very clear. There was no interference in this matter, and the commissioner has confirmed that in her statement she released on Tuesday. The Honourable Member for Miramichi Grand Lake. Mr. Speaker, the government has hit a new low to ram through legislation. Superintendent Campbell noted that Commissioner Lucky told the RCMP that she had promised the Minister of Public Safety and the Prime Minister's office that the force would disclose the type of firearms used in the mass shooting because it was advanced the government's pending gun control wow. legislation. Wow. Will the Prime Minister admit that he used the suffering and death of Nova Scotians for personal political gain? Yes, no. The Honourable Minister for Emergency Preparedness. Mr. Mr. Speaker, that statement is absolutely false. And, and in fact, I would remind this, this, this House that our government promised Canadians in the summer of 2019 that we would strengthen gun control and that we would ban military-style assault, assault rifles. I'm, go I'm, going to, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to interrupt. The, the Honourable Minister from the top, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as I've said, the, the, the member's comments, unfortunately, are absolutely false. And in fact, I would remind this House that in the summer of 2019, we made a promise to Canadians that we would strengthen gun control and ban military assault rifles. When the Prime Minister appointed me Public Safety Minister, he placed in my man letter, mandate letter a direction to ban military assault rifles. Mr. Speaker, we made that promise to Canadians, and we kept that promise to Canadians. The Honourable Member for Sturgeon River Parkland. Mr. Speaker, during the April 28th meeting with the RCMP Commissioner and Superintendent Campbell, handwritten notes state that the Commissioner promised to release information about an active criminal investigation to support a pending announcement on gun control. Now, the Minister of Emergency Preparedness has been standing in this House saying that there was no interference, but the Prime Minister just said there was no undue interference. The story is changing. The Commissioner was working with the government to advance their political agenda. Does the the minister deny it. Before, before, before we go on to the answer, two things. I want everyone to respect each other. And when we are making statements in the House, please be very judicious on the words you use. Uh, accusing someone of being, I'm hearing names from one side and other uh, absolute uh, 
uh, terms from the other. I just want to remind everyone to be judicious. We want to leave on a nice note before we go to summer. So, the Honourable Minister. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, and perhaps it will be helpful if I read the entire statement of the RCMP Commissioner issued Tuesday. Mr. Speaker, the Commissioner writes, it's important to note that the sharing of information and briefings with the Minister of Public Safety are a necessary action, particularly during the mass shooting on Canadian soil. This is standard procedure, and it does not impact the integrity of ongoing investigations or interfere with the independence of the RCMP. And she concludes, Mr. Speaker, by stating, I take the principle of police independence extremely seriously. It has been and will continue to be fully respected in all interactions. Mr. Speaker, there was no interference. The Honourable Member for Thérèse de Blainville. Mr. Speaker, no one is surprised by the passport crisis. The union warned the government in January. It was predictable. Since 2018, the government has cut 450 positions at passports. So, in the very midst of a crisis, the 600 hirings that the minister is talking about are not an increase in service. They are just a return to pre-pandemic levels. Mr. Speaker, we are in crisis. This requires a crisis effort. When will the minister deploy a sufficient number of people to open offices seven days a week? The Honourable Minister for Families. Mr. Speaker, passport offices are open on weekends in the busiest urban centres to ensure that people who need their passport in an urgent manner can get one. We have hired 600 staff starting in January. We are hiring 600 more. We are reassigning Service Canada staff and other department staff, for example, CRA staff, StatsCan staff, IRCC staff, and staff from other offices. We are putting everything in position to rectify this unacceptable situation for Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Thérèse de Blainville, Mr. Speaker. The union is trying to find these 600 people. Well, they found, found five new people at Guy Favreau. Well, the union expects a return to normalcy only in October. The chaos cannot last another four months. The minister can call on uh, retirees for help. She can move resources from other departments. She can create a training blitz for new staff. At the very least, she could let in people who are sleeping outside and make sure that they are treated humanely, even if it means hiring out other rooms. That is crisis management. What is the minister waiting for? The Honourable Minister for Families. Mr. Speaker, we have already done everything that my honourable colleague has enumerated. It takes 15 weeks to train a passport officer. This training, had, uh, this training started months ago, and the new class will start on Monday. This is not something that can be changed overnight. This has already been in place for months, Mr. Speaker. The situation in Montreal is better today. In Laval and Saint Laurent, we have made sure that everyone receives an appointment at Guy Favreau. We are currently making sure that the hundreds of people there receive their appointments, and we will continue to put everything in position to serve Canadians. The Honourable Member for Thérèse de Blainville. Mr. Speaker, there is a gap between what is said and what is done. The passport crisis is not just an administrative fiasco. There are people at the very end of their tether in the rain as we speak. There are people missing their parents' funerals. There are people who are losing work contracts. And the minister's message to these people is basically, your call is important to us. When will the people in the queues feel that this is actually true, that their situation is being taken seriously? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker. We are taking this situation very seriously, and that is the very reason for which we have changed our strategy in Montreal. The situation in Montreal is an extraordinary one. It's different to other parts of the country. We've had 1,500, 2,000 people waiting outside of passport offices in the past seven days. Every single person in the line today has received an appointment, either for today, tomorrow, Saturday and Sunday in order to ensure that they will receive their passports. 
That is what we want, and that is what we are doing, Mr. Speaker. For Selkirk, Interlake, Eastman. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Emergency Preparedness politically interfered in a mass murder investigation to advance his own party's political agenda. RCMP Superintendent Darren Campbell witnessed this interference firsthand, but the Minister is claiming he's just made this all up. Former RCMP Commissioner Polson said Superintendent Darren Campbell is one of the best investigators in the force and a highly reliable officer with tremendous integrity. Why should Canadians believe this minister over that of a well-respected RCMP officer? The Honourable Minister for Emergency Preparedness. Mr. Speaker, I have absolutely no doubt that Superintendent Campbell is, in fact, an exemplary officer and have absolutely no intention of questioning his, his integrity. However, Mr. Speaker, I also want to make it very clear that, that there was no interference in this case for any reason. And with respect to the, the prohibition of assault rifles, it was something that we were deeply committed to. And, Mr. Speaker, the, 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 the vicious murder of 22 Canadians with, using firearms deepened our resolve to make Canadians safe and to keep our promise. Yeah, your promise. The Honourable Member for Selkirk Interlake East. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's no surprise here that this minister and this Prime Minister pressured the RCMP Commissioner into doing their bidding. Let's remember that the Ethics Commissioner found this Prime Minister guilty yeah. for political interference when, for, when he pressured former Attorney General Jody Wilson-Raybould into doing his bidding, but she got fired because she said no. Now the Minister is accusing Superintendent Darren Campbell, who has a stellar reputation of just making up a story. So how can the minister expect Canadians to believe his unethical, scandal-played government over that of a stellar RCMP officer? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, the only thing being made up is, is, is criticism of Superintendent Campbell. I offer none. I, the, I'm, I'm absolutely certain the man is an exemplary police officer and a man of integrity, and I have no criticism of him. What I am advising this House, however, is that there was no interference in this case. There, there was no pressure brought upon the Commissioner for any reason, and the Commissioner has... I'm going to stop for a second again. I'll follow the advice of the Honourable Member and let the Honourable Minister start again. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, and I'm happy to have the opportunity to dispute, frankly, a false statement by my, my colleague across the aisle. I am, have not and will not criticize. I offer no criticism whatsoever to Superintendent Campbell, who I believe to be, based on all of the evidence, an exemplary officer, and I'm not questioning his integrity. However, Mr. Speaker, I think it's important for me to be very clear. There was no interference in this case, Mr. Speaker. There was no pressure brought to bear on the RCMP Commissioner, and in fact, the Commissioner has in confirmed that there was no pressure in a statement that she issued on Tuesday. Thank you very much. Member from Grand Prairie, Mackenzie. Leah Scanlon, Director of Communications for the RCMP, said this of Commissioner Lucky. She went out and did it. It was all political pressure. That is 100% the Minister and the Prime Minister. And we have a Commissioner that doesn't push back. Mr. Speaker, that Minister has said that he trusts these RCMP members. He says he stands behind the Commissioner. The question is, who's not telling the truth? The Honourable Minister for Emergency Preparedness. Well, Mr. Speaker, histrionics aside, I would direct the members to the Commissioner's statement from Tuesday, in which she makes very clear that there was no interference. But, Mr. Speaker, I'd remind this House that Canadians, including those who were directly impacted by this tragedy, expressed very serious concerns about how and when the RCMP shared information with the public. And in response to the concerns expressed by the, by the victims and families in this terrible tragedy, our government specified in the order of reference the Mass Casualty Commission that they examine the communications approach taken both during and after this event. Mr. Speaker, that commission will hear testimony under oath and their findings will be important to provide accurate information to the families of this terrible tragedy. Yes. The Honourable Member for Cowichan, Malahat, Langford. Mr. Speaker, families who lost loved ones in the worst mass shooting in Canadian history want answers. The idea that a government would compromise this investigation is unacceptable. 
Nova Scotians have suffered enough. There are very serious allegations of interference in the RCMP's investigation for the Liberals' political gain. Now, yesterday, the minister questioned the accuracy of these allegations, but the integrity of the claims is supported by a former RCMP commissioner. Will the minister be transparent in explaining what role the PMO played in this investigation? The Honourable Minister for Emergency Preparedness. I'm happy to have the opportunity to explain to the member. The Prime Minister's office nor the Public Safety Minister's office had any role in interfering or pressuring the RCMP to make any operational decisions with respect to the investigation or in their communications around the investigation. But we did hear very serious criticism and concern by the families of the, of the victims of this terrible tragedy and by Nova Scotians across the province with respect to the communications that took place during this event and after. And it's precisely why we, we have tasked the Mass Casualty Commission with looking very specifically at the communications that took place both during and after this event because those families deserve The Honourable Member for Vancouver, Kingsway. Mr. Speaker, health experts are raising the alarm. According to the Canadian Medical Association, our healthcare system is collapsing around us. Healthcare workers are dealing with severe burnout and leaving the profession. Patients are being treated in cars, wait months for diagnosis, and are suffering without care. Despite this, the Liberals are missing in action. Will this government call an immediate meeting with provinces and territories to address the health care staffing crisis and provide significant, stable, long-term federal funding for health care to Canadians? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm delighted to be able to speak to that matter. We have had many discussions and a lot of actions in the last few weeks and months with my colleagues, health ministers. It is true, our health care workers are very burdened physically and mentally with COVID-19 and many other serious issues. In fact, Mr. Speaker, I'm speaking, I'm speaking again, to, again this afternoon with my colleagues, health ministers, on that topic and many others. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Kitchener, Conestoga. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. While many Canadians struggle with mental health issues, certain groups in Canada are more likely to face disproportionate challenges among uh, accessing mental health supports. Recently, the Minister for Mental Health and Addictions announced $8.6 million to support community-based programs related to mental health promotion. This will increase health equity, help to address the underlying determinants of health, and improve supports. Can the Minister inform this House on the funding our government announced to support the mental health of Canadians? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sir, for mental health. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for Kitchener-Conestoga for the question and his hard work and advocacy on mental health, but also the importance of music and the arts. We are committed to addressing disparities and promoting positive mental health. This funding has created comprehensive support systems for people in need of them, investing in these community-led projects that address the mental health of children, youth, refugees and newcomers and their caregivers, integral in our holistic approach to healing. We will continue to support projects which have the potential to improve health outcomes and which support mental health and address substance use of people across the country. The Honourable Member for Kenora. Mr. Speaker, at 7.7% inflation is at another record high. The price of gas this week in Dryden is 2.15 a litre. It's 2.20 in Kenora and over 230 in Red Lake and Sioux Lookout. Yet this government is the only in the G7 that is not considering a plan to provide immediate relief at the pumps. Mr. Speaker, when will this government get serious about the affordability crisis we are facing and provide a real plan to address inflation? Minister for Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I've said, uh, Canada is focused very much on two elements of this. The first is addressing the affordability challenges facing Canadians. That is something that is critically important for all government members on this side of the House. My colleague, the Minister of Finance, uh, went through a number of initiatives that are underway to try to address the affordability issue for Canadians. But we are also working internationally to address the energy security crisis by increasing production of oil and gas alongside our American counterparts, our Brazilian counterparts and others, to ensure that we're actually stabilizing global energy markets and bringing prices down. The Honourable Member for Charleswood, St. James, Sidiboya, Headingley. Mr. Speaker, this week Canadians received even more devastating news caused by this government. Inflation rose to 7.7% in May. 
This included a 12% rise in the price of gasoline and a 9.7% increase in the prices of groceries, all basic necessities for working families in my riding. When will this Liberal NDP government finally acknowledge that their plan to pour gasoline on the fire with their out of control, excessive spending is actually hurting Canadians? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives really need to pick a lane when it comes to economic policy. Half of the time, Mr. Speaker, we hear them proposing tax expenditures. And then the other half of the time, they accuse us of spending too much money to support Canadians. Now, I want to tell you, Mr. Speaker, during COVID, we did support Canadians, and that was the right thing to do. And we had a policy that was relentlessly focused on a jobs recovery. And, Mr. Speaker, it has worked. 117% of jobs recovered, compared to just 96% in the U.S. The Honourable Member for Kelowna Lake Country. Well, Mr. Speaker, that comment is completely out of touch with what people are going through. That's right. yeah. You know, the last time inflation was this high, my parents were buying our first family microwave. We had a Prime Minister with the same last name as the current one, and Joni Loves Chachi was the new sitcom. 7.7% .7 inflation isn't just a number. An Ipsos survey found more and more Canadians believe that their standard of living is decreasing. A dad in my riding said his family of five is now spending $400 a week on food, and he goes without meals so his kids can eat. When will this government stop making excuses, stop blaming others, and do anything to tackle inflation? Mr. Speaker, we absolutely understand that the cost of living is a real challenge for Canadians. And I would start by pointing out that having a job is the single most important thing for most Canadians when it comes to affording the cost of living. And that's why an unemployment rate at 5.1% is really, really important and something we work together to achieve. I also want to say, Mr. Speaker, I know that Canadians are smart. And I know that Canadians understand inflation is a global phenomenon, Mr. Speaker. This is Vladimir Putin's inflation, and Canadians know it. The Honourable Member for Mission Metsky Fraser Canyon. Well, Mr. Speaker, inflation might be over 7% nationally, but it's over 8% in British Columbia. And these levels have not been seen since the last Trudeau was in office. Families in Mission Metsky Fraser Canyon are struggling to put food on the table. They're struggling to pay $2.30, $2.30 for a litre of gas, and they, they can't even afford to get to work. Yet this government refuses to act. Now, last week, Scotia Bank's chief economist came out and they basically said, Government of Canada, rein in your spending. So if the, conser if the Liberals won't heed the advice of the Conservatives, will they at least listen to one of Canada's top economists and stop screwing over Canadians? Yeah. Again, I just order. I just want to remind the honourable members bent over. to use their language judiciously. Like you were in a classroom talking to students. I'm sure nobody would want to hear language like that in a classroom if they were talking. And there are children watching this program, so let's try to keep it clean. The on Hold it. Whoa. Order. Order. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government absolutely understands that fiscal restraint is an important part of our fight against inflation. And Mr. Speaker, that is what we put forward in the budget in April, as recognized by S&P with our AAA credit rating. In fact, Canada is tied with the U.S. for the fastest rate of fiscal consolidation of debt and deficit reduction in the G7. But Mr. Speaker, I know that member opposite ran in the election last year, and I I'd like to remind him that on the campaign trail, they actually proposed more spending, a bigger deficit than we did. The Honourable Member for Pierre Boucher, Les Patriotes Verchères. Mr. Speaker, the federal government is stealing $350 million that it had promised our municipalities for green infrastructure and transit. 
It promised that in an agreement signed with Quebec, but it's gone back on its signature and is pocketing the money. The Bloc Québécois was already denouncing that betrayal, and today the Quebec Union the municipalities and the mayor of Montreal are also asking the same thing. They're asking for the signed agreement to be respected. Because if you sign an agreement and you don't send the money promised, that's theft. Will the government give the municipalities the $350 million that were agreed to? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Seem to be having some technical difficulties. The honourable, the honourable minister for public safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am very pleased to answer my colleague's question. We are staying in contact with the government of Quebec currently on a number of priorities, including the federal funding that the that my colleague mentioned. We will check and finalize the details of that federal funding to build on previous successes of our collaboration with the Quebec government. The Honourable Member for Pierre Bouchelet, Patriot Verchère. Mr. Speaker, at committee two weeks ago, the minister said that Quebec wouldn't get any of the $350 million. And Ottawa didn't just steal that money, it also unilaterally moved forward the deadline by two years, the deadline for infrastructure projects, which means that Quebec only has nine months to rush to submit applications for the $4 billion that it has a right to. If not, Ottawa will do the same thing. It will pocket the $4 billion. And too bad for our towns and municipalities with their infrastructure needs and in fighting climate change. That will just go down the drain. So will the government correct this betrayal and respect to the agreement? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the, let's talk about the agreement. The agreement that Quebec signed actually agreed to put forward the projects that they wanted to see us support and make a priority. We would love to see the infrastructure dollars identified for Quebec get out the door. But Mr. Speaker, is the member opposite actually suggesting that there are no infrastructure needs in all of Quebec over the next three years? I would suggest that there are significant needs that Quebec could put forward that Quebecers would love to see us contribute to, and we hope that the Quebec government will honour their agreement and set put forward those priorities so we can get these funds out the door and contribute. The Honourable Member for Banff Airdrie. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Speaker, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. The last time inflation was this high, the Prime Minister's father was in office. A recent Ipsos poll reveals that 72 per cent of Canadian families with kids are worried about putting food on the table. And and Food Banks Canada is reporting that 23% of Canadians are eating less than they should due to rising food costs. There are many great family traditions, but making Canadians poor shouldn't be one of them. <laughs> when will this government learn from the past and fix inflation before it gets worse? There it is. Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we absolutely recognize that affordability is a real challenge for many Canadian families. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, we are so glad that in this year's budget and in last year's budget, we put in place affordability measures that are coming on tap now, that are supporting Canadian families today in meaningful ways. Let me talk about the Canada Workers' Benefit. This is for our most vulnerable working poor. $2,400 arriving starting in April. For Regina Louvan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as my father always said, Trudeau times were tough times back in the 80s, Mr. Speaker. So we have the highest inflation rate since 1983 at 7.7%. We've heard the tired old talking points 
And we know this finance minister's only solution is to increase spending and raise taxes. That is simply not working. Now more than 72% of Canadians are hard enough, find it hard to make their paycheck last till the end of the month, Mr. Speaker. This government only cares about their rich friends and elitist donors, and they really are out of touch with the realities of families across Saskatchewan. Isn't that the truth, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. You know, Mr. Speaker, when I grew up, the saying was actually Tory times are tough times, and that's what Canadians in the prairies understand. And you know what, Mr. Speaker, let me tell you what is out of touch. What is... I'm just going to interrupt. I'm having a hard time hearing, and I've got... I've got speakers on all sides of me here, and I, it's, it's being very tough to hear, so I'm just going to ask everybody to calm down. I know, I know, by the sounds of it, everybody wants to get back to the part of the country that they come from so that they can be with their constituents. So let's see if we can get this done peacefully and nicely so that we can all go off and say goodbye for the summer. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Okay, Mr. Speaker, thank you. So let me tell you what is really out of touch. What is out of touch is not to understand that the single most important thing for the vast majority of Canadians is to have a job. And that is why we will never apologize for a relentlessly jobs-focused approach to the post-COVID recovery. 117% of jobs recovered compared to just 96% in the U.S., Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. The Liberals want to make inflation about international events beyond their control. They blame Russia for the rising costs of food and gas. They blame travellers for their airport mess. They blame Canadians for waiting too long to renew their passports. They blame individual complexities for the immigration backlog. Skyrocketing housing? Not their fault either. The government is quick to take credit when things are good and blame everyone else when Canadians are struggling. Can anyone on the other side answer a basic question at least, and, or at least tell us when they plan on bringing people back to work to fix their chaos? The Honourable Minister for Families. I think the member opposite owes the hard-working public servants an apology because when it comes to service Canada, they have back in the office four months serving Canadians. These are the same people who delivered nine million Canadians. Shame on you! I'm going to, I'm going to have to uh, wait a moment. Please let me know when we can continue. I think we can continue. The Honourable Minister. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite owes the hard-working public servants an apology because they have been working day in and day out to serve Canadians. I understand that Canadians are frustrated. There are a lot of challenges right now, and this government is working hard to serve them. The only thing I can conjure from that member's response is that like hard-working people across this country, when the members of Parliament, uh, Conservative members of Parliament weren't working from home, they weren't working. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, I just want to remind everyone that I know tensions are high and everybody is looking forward to getting out of this place, but please be judicious when we use our words. The Honourable Member for Dorval la chine la salle Monsieur le Président, Mr. Speaker, this year, planting season was stressful and uncertain for our agricultural producers. The increase in the cost of inputs limited their capacity to invest in their operations. Given the context, can the Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food tell this House about the latest measures implemented to help our farmers? Thank you very much. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have good news for farmers today. I would like to announce that we will increase the interest-free portion of the Advanced Payments Program for two years. 
That represents an increase in the threshold from 100,000 to 250,000. We will increase the interest-free portion of the advance payment program from from, from 100,000 to 250,000 dollars. This will represent 61 million dollars back in the pocket of farmers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. RCMP Superintendent Campbell's notes reveal Commissioner Lucky told the RCMP that she had promised the Minister of Public Safety and the Prime Minister's office the force would disclose which firearms were used in the mass shooting to advance the government's pending gun control legislation. Former RCMP Commissioner Paulson says Superintendent Campbell, quote, is one of the best investigators in the force and a highly reliable officer with tremendous integrity. You won't find a practice police officer who will speak ill of Darren Campbell, end quote. Speaker, does the minister believe Superintendent Campbell? Here, here. Minister for Emergency Preparedness. Mr. Speaker, I strongly believe you won't find a former police officer that will speak ill of him either, and, and I'm not speaking it in any way. But, Mr. Speaker, I would point the members as well to the Commissioner's statement in which he said it's important to note that the sharing of information and briefings with the Minister of Public Safety are necessary, particularly during a mass shooting event. And she said, I take the principle of police independence extremely seriously, and it has been and will continue to be fully respected. Mr. Speaker, there was no interference in this case. The Honourable Member for Barry Innisfil. RCMP Superintendent Campbell is an honest officer with a solid reputation. Former commissioners, deputy commissioners, and other RCMP veterans from across Canada are speaking up to defend the man's character. Campbell's notes show that his team of investigators were under political pressure and interference from Brenda Lucky on behalf of the Prime Minister and the Minister of Public Safety. But this Ottawa gang have all denied they meddled in the most tragic crime in Nova Scotia's history. It's never the crime, it's always the cover-up. Someone is lying, lying, and it's not Campbell. Is it Lucky, the Prime Minister, the former Minister, or all three? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we make no comment whatsoever in a conversation between the Commissioner and her subordinates, and I have no reason and will not and have not questioned the Superintendent's integrity. But, Mr. Speaker, I would remind my colleagues that there is an independent public inquiry currently underway in Nova Scotia, the Mass Casualty Commission. They, these issues of how communications were done are being addressed and where witnesses will be called to testify under oath. Mr. Speaker, the Mass Casualty Commission and their work is important to the families and victims of, of, of victims' families in Nova Scotia, and we support their important work. Well, member for Barry Innisfil. Mark Norman. Jody Wilson-Raybould, Darren Campbell. What do they all have in common? They spoke truth to power and their reputations were attacked. But not before the Liberals gaslit Canadians about their underhanded role in manipulating the criminal justice system. In Campbell's case, the Prime Minister, the former Minister and the RCMP Commissioner are staying true to form. They've all lined up a fall guy, but Canadians won't buy it this time. When will the good guys stop paying the price? And when will the Liberals stop manipulating the criminal justice system to suit their crass political self-interest? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I, I would state that any, any claim of, of, of any criticism of Superintendent Campbell is just crass political self-interest from the member opposite. There's been no criticism of Superintendent Campbell. Just a simple statement of fact, Mr. Speaker, and the simple statement of fact is that there was no interference in this case. The Commissioner has confirmed it, and there, there was no interference, no pressure, no promises. Once again, I just want to remind the Honourable Members that accusing people of or someone, I can hear the shout coming out, and it's easy to narrow into about three or four voices, and one in particular, I don't want to hear that accusation again. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Richmond Hill. Mr. Speaker, Canada has a long and proud history of welcoming newcomers with open arms. There are several amazing organizations in my riding of Richmond Hill that provide support services to help people settle into their new communities. It takes immense bravery to move to a new country, and while this choice is typically made by adults, we know that newcomer children and youth can also be deeply impacted. This is especially the case for young people who arrive to Canada as refugees. Can the Minister of Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship tell us what actions are being taken 
to ensure the newcomer children and youth have access to culturally sensitive mental health supports. The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my colleague, who I would note is a champion for mental health and has been since the day that I've met him. Children who are fleeing war are amongst the most vulnerable people in the world. I'm so pleased to share that earlier this week I was able to announce that a partnership, through a partnership with the Kids Help Phone, they're going to be providing services in Pashto, Dari, Ukrainian and Russian for the new, newcomers from Afghanistan and Ukraine who are seeking services and need mental health supports in our communities. I'm so proud because this is part of a $2 million project over the next couple of years that's going to see the Kids Help Phone expand their services into over 100 different languages to serve Canadians and newcomers to our communities. I'm so proud of this investment and once again want to thank my colleague for his advocacy for mental health, in particular for refugee children in Canada. Honourable Member for Victoria. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals should never have bought the Trans Mountain Pipeline. It threatens our climate and our coasts, and now the Parliamentary Budget Officer, the government's own watchdog, has confirmed it will lose money. Unbelievably, the Liberals promised to use the profits from TMX to fight the climate crisis. But now what's their excuse? Losing money isn't a plan to fund climate action. This pipeline has always been a lose-lose for Canadians and a failure for the Liberals. So why does the Prime Minister keep doubling down on this economic and environmental boondoggle? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Canadians, we know how important it is to get our resources to market and to get fair value for them. And Russia's war in Ukraine is yet another reason Canada needs to be concerned about energy security for ourselves and for our allies. The government does not intend to be the long-term owner of this project. A deinvestment process will be initiated once the project is more advanced, de-risked, and critically when consultations with Indigenous peoples are concluded. The Honourable Member for Spadina, Fort York. Mr. Speaker, fuel costs continue to soar. Inflation and food prices are at their highest in 40 years. With Canadians facing unprecedented struggles to get by, the government reverts to re-announcement of programs. Mr. Speaker, government smoke and mirrors won't pay the mortgage or rent, nor does it put food on the table. Will the government eliminate its disgraceful triple-dipping tax on gas? President Biden has asked for a three-month federal gas tax holiday. Has this government clued in on this? Is it going to do anything? The Honourable Minister, the Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question, because it gives me a chance to talk to Canadians about the measures that we have in place to help them with affordability. This year, there will be a $500 payment to help Canadians who are facing challenges with housing affordability, because we know that that is a real challenge for many. This year, the OAS is going to increase by 10%. That means seniors 75 and older will get an additional $815, Mr. Speaker. I'm afraid that's all the time we have today for question two. Following discussions among representatives of all parties in the House, I understand that there's an agreement to observe a moment of silence in memory of the victims of Air India Flight 182. I now invite the honourable members to rise.
Merci. Conformément à l'ordre. Pursuant to order made on Thursday, November 25th, 2021, the House will now.